love this music so much. <laughs> I'm just going to start playing this in my car all the time. Welcome back, everyone, to Startup Security Weekly. I am so excited to talk about the stories for this week. This first one. I mean, it was like, Michael, you were a fly on the wall in my office this week. Because this I, uh, is exactly what we've been talking about. Well, well it's probably, is- probably spend a lot of time on it as I have a lot of thoughts as... <laughs> We're coming up with uh, not just Freeman, but open source uh, model for oh, right our on. company. Oh, very so, cool. And uh, breaking news, you heard it here first on Startup Security Weekly. Well, I, yeah, so the first story is just about how to make Freeman work for you. And um, I, I like it a lot. I'd like to hear more about what, what you're doing with it. And, um, and I, I think it's maybe even an opportunity uh, if people hadn't watched the Security Weekly interview that we did with Corey Doctorow. Mm-hmm. He's a master of yes. this, and he gives away a lot of the stuff that he does for free, and yet is still able to make money on it. Still able to do a lot of good mm-hmm. things as a result, and that's one of those things that's really got me in tune to it. But now, um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about some of the things that you're figuring out. So, what are you what are you figuring out about it? So what are you guys looking at? When we look at selling, when you're a startup, you can have a product and. It's going to be hard to sell it at first. When we've talked about this on previous episodes, the struggle that that brings, the most common question is, well, like, can I try it? Or can you give me some use cases of people that have used it? So I'm of the opinion, and you may agree or disagree, that if you've got a product and a plan and you go get some funding before you have customers. That is a strategy. It's not one we're going to employ. I feel like you can take that money and take some time and build a sales force and the sales is going to be really hard, but you're going to get to market. And a lot of companies have, have done that successfully. And that's one model. However, John and I kind of, <laughs> John's words are, you know, we're really good at guerrilla warfare, <laughs> right? So... What we've decided to do is that rather than take money too early, which is, I think, a big, big mistake, it may work for you and that's fine. For us, we've identified that as probably being a big mistake, that we're going to take a portion of our product and open source that, give it away for free, right? Let people get a taste. And then if they want more, then they can go buy the commercial product. That has incredible value for a lot of reasons, which we'll talk about. However, the struggle that I can really only give you sort of a guide on is how do you offer that for free and what do you give them and how do you control it, if at all, um, is dangerous. And, and that's, I mean, that's something you're going to have to figure out for yourself depending yeah, on I think that's what, what you're giving lot, away for free, right? I think that's what holds a lot of people back from it, right? Yeah. So here's some interesting things. Let's, let's go back over this concept of freemium j- j- in the odd chance somebody's not familiar with it. But if you've ever used Dropbox or you've ever used pretty much any of the, the current web solutions uh, or my services. My ba- favorite examples are MailChimp, yep, MailChimp. Sightly, um, yep. and some of the web application scanners as well, like NetSparker, for example, who's a sponsor of our other show, but they've got a, a, a model like that too. And those are go. three that I've used the freemium model and very quickly said, I want to buy it. Yep. Like and, that's, that, look, and that means they're doing it right. <laughs> well, that's exactly right. So the idea here is that you say to somebody, I'm going to give you some portion of this, some limited functionality. But now when we say limited, I don't mean it's useless, it's hamstrung, it's locked, you've got to pay to unlock it. Well, that's Those the models don't part. work as well. Yeah, and yeah. that's absolutely the tricky part. But the idea is I'm going to give you some, some value of this for free, and I'm going to show you the value that if you pay to unlock the rest of it, you're gonna you're gonna do even better as a result of it. I had somebody explain it to me one time is I want to give you enough value that you get excited and yes. help you understand the suck of not having it so that you're more inclined to pay for it. It's but one of th- the finest lines that you walk, right, when you do that is and, if you, you do it right, it can be really successful. If you, you do I- it if you do it wrong, one or two things are gonna happen. Um, one the users are just, they're so locked out of the features that they're not going to get excited about it and they're going to move on to something else. So you can't, you can't be too crazy in locking it down. If you're too open with it, those problems will multiply down the road and can potentially have very serious impacts on your business. So we'll business. call it freemium debt. <laughs> it's freemium debt and you'll have so much freemium debt that you could not recover or it can make it really hard. You're only going to recover a certain amount. 
I mean, well, I, 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 I personally I, know companies that are like, uh, I won't give the specific example. They're like, you know, a couple hundred thousand customers that, yeah, that's, you know, they're using our product and there's nothing we can do. They're using well, it for yeah, free. I, I think there's a, there's a trade off here. Um, and, and the line that you find is that if you give too much away for free, I find two things happen. One, it, it's not worth much, right? It's free. It didn't it didn't cost anything? Yes. So yes. You're diminishing they may or may your not value. Be invested in it. Mm -hmm. So if your solution to that is here, let me throw more stuff into it. You've de you've devalued your overall value, and and that means people are going to be willing to pay less for it. Now, this is interesting. Uh, Chris Anderson, he's done a lot of the work in this area, and he he writes about the long tail, and he he pretty on the front of this. So he says that in his book, uh, his book is called Free. He said freemium works on the five percent rule. 5% of the premium customers support the remaining 95% of free users. Mm -hmm. And this, I think, is actually the key. And also, the cost of servicing the 95% is close to zero. Right. There you go. That's the tricky part, too. And it, Yeah, so it's, it's the, the question is, how do I give you something that you find that's valuable, it doesn't cost me any money, that gets you through to solve a problem that you have, and as a result, you want to give me more money to help you solve yep. more or better of that problem. That's a good summary of it. Uh, some of the more detailed things that we're discussing is, and I think in, initially it might not seem like a big deal, but as you grow larger in whatever measurement you're, you're looking at for growth, uh, competition can take advantage of your freemium model. And so one of the discussions where, mm. you know, a lot of companies have is they've got this great thing. They give away a piece of it for free um do we give them access to an api and then if, if that happens two things are going to happen one smart customers are going to go oh i can get the free one i can look at the api and i can just get whatever value out of that through the api and apply it to the rest of my stuff i don't need to pay for it great competition also looks at that and says well don't buy it from them just use the free one and then our product like looks into their API and looks into this other person's API and this other person's API. And we just put mm. all that together and you can just buy our product and not really have to pay for anyone else's product. And <clears throat> so your competition, <coughs> excuse me, we'll use that against you. I think it's interesting. Yeah. And look, I, I spend a lot of time looking at mindset, <laughs> right? So, so I look at the distinction between the scarcity mindset that says, okay, if, if, if they're not working with us, then they're working against us. Uh, and versus the abundance mindset that says, okay, let me, let me go help and let me do it differently. And I've kind of got two thoughts, but, but just listening to you, I, I'll tell you about something that recently happened to me. I'm using one of these solutions, and I, I frankly didn't realize that they had a, a freemium model. Uh, and I was paying at, at a higher level. Now, mm -hmm. where I think they made a mistake is they sent out a note and they said, hey, we've held our prices the same for all these years, and now it's time for us to do an increase. And the increase was negligible. It was five bucks a month maybe. Right. But, it, but it was enough that I looked at it and went, wait, am I getting that much value out of this? And then I went and I looked over their features and I said, nope. Mm -hmm. So what it did was it caused me to start looking at alternatives. But here's the fascinating part. I had uh, the, this thought of how about I just email them. So I emailed them. I said, look, it's not worth the money I'm paying right now. And it's your fault. You triggered me to review it. But more importantly, um, I kind of like it. What do you have? And the guy's like, listen. Based on what you just said, you should just use our free version. Wow. I went, that's not a bad idea. <clears throat> okay, well, let's try it. They helped me step down to the free version. They made sure I was all good to go. Mm. Now, what's interesting when you said the API was I lost the ability. So on their free version, uh, it doesn't work for my mobile devices. Mm -hmm. You know what? Doesn't matter to me. Doesn't Didn't matter to you. Didn't you? I had it on the mobile right. devices. You know how often they used it? Almost never. Mm -hmm. So that wasn't a problem for me. But here's the interesting thing. Now that they have me, uh, they kept me as a, a subscriber. So I, I paid for like two years. Now, they, but they didn't lose me as a customer. I didn't defect to somebody else. Those dollars aren't going to somebody else. And at some point in the future, it's likely that I might need or want one of those bigger features. And I'll be paying them again. So I just wanted to point out there's, there's, there, interesting there's, still, there's still there's so much benefit to keeping you as a free customer. Um, yeah. One is that they're still collecting your data, most likely, in oh, some yeah. way, shape, form, or fashion. Hopefully anonymously, and hopefully they're being very honest uh, as to how they're collecting your data and using your data. And it's, uh, I hope, the way, That's the right way to question. do it is, is anonymous. Thanks for keeping anonymous. me up tonight. <laughs> yeah, 
Well, the way they should be doing it is anonymous, right? Should. So yeah. they're just tracking usage and using that uh, statistics. They're also, since you're a registered subscriber, <clears throat> they can still reach out to you with stuff. In that, in, in that's of benefit. Hopefully, they're not reselling your stuff afterwards unless they're disclosing that. No, that they don't would be seem bad. to be. Yeah. No. But they're, no, it, they, they can keep in communication with you. They can invite you to a, a webinar, an event, they, or whatever. Webinars right? monthly. They do newsletters yeah. monthly. I've gotten value out of them. Now, the, the reality is, I don't think I'm their target demographic. Mm -hmm. But that's the point, though. What if it changes? What if they have some new feature they introduce? There's some, and I look at that and I go, oh. Because what this, what this also caused me to do, Paul, was reevaluate how I was using the tool. Yes. And I actually think I'm using it a whole lot better. So so I'm happy. Yeah, I'm not giving them I mean we're talking a couple hundred bucks a year. This wasn't huge, but yet it, it was fascinating. And so I so I really kind of I like that angle to it. So now, if you're going to offer a freemium model, um the best place to do that is in the cloud and make people register so it's sticky. And what's happened over time is that if you give it away and let them install it on their own and just use it without connecting back, they're just going to keep using it and that's it. You're done. Don't make that mistake. Yeah. And I think that's actually a good point and, and that matches the experience here. Now, here's the other part. So what, what I would love about our parallel journeys is that um, I, I don't know if it, if it would be fair to say I'm using premium, or premium uh, but I'll tell you the two things that I've done that I think are kind of interesting. And, and I think it fits back into the conversation that you're having as well. And so when it comes to security, this is something that I feel very passionate about. I think you do too, especially given all that we do to try to share stuff with people here. Is, uh, is that, so I made the Straight Talk framework free. That, that's not free as in freemium. That's is, as in uh, I've got an update coming to it. Uh, I'm excited about it. It's, it's a way that we can start to have better conversations in the industry. Now, what's interesting is... I have two things happening. I have people calling me, telling me how it's helped them. It's saved deals, it's improved yes. projects, it's imp and that's awesome. <clears throat> but what's really cool is I also get the people saying, okay, so I've looked at it, I like it. I'm not sure how this works. Do you have any examples? Now, not related to the freemium per se, but I, I launched that course. I can't rave about how awesome it is to launch something as long as you're transparent about it. Mm -hmm. Your cohort one, I'm gonna learn, we're gonna work together on it, this is all really exciting. Paul, I've got examples now. I'm starting to look at different ways to do that programming right, and right. answer those questions for other people just trying it on their own. And that's really exciting. So one of the other things I've been looking at, and again, this is, this is borderline freemium. I've been looking at the way that other people onboard, but not just straight onboarding, but teach you into it. And one of the things I'm going to be putting together, so again, right, you're going to hear it here first. Uh, sometime I'm shooting for early October, I'm going to put together a, a multi-part sequence no registration other than give me your email address and I'm going to give you like five to seven videos and I'm actually going to carry people through how to answer these five questions. Now, when you talk about the freemium though, where that line is, doing the launch helped me figure out a key distinction. I'm going to make three levels. There's the casual, I want to understand what the framework is. Then there's the, I think this is going to benefit me personally but I'm never really going to lead a group with it. Mm -hmm. And then there's that, I need to know how to make this work. That perspective switching thing and that's right. how I pull it all together. Paul, going through that process has helped me understand where those levels are. Mm -hmm. And now I can start walking back and say, okay, so I can add some additional free stuff here. And when you use that and you see that that's valuable to you, but you're not sure how to really filter or prompt it better, or you're not sure how to lead it, or you're not sure how you'd work with somebody else, Right. Well, I've got a solution for that. But all the other stuff I'll give away for free. So there's two parts here. One, it's really driven by let's give it away and get more people talking about it and figuring it out. That's going to solve a lot of problems. And I'll keep leveling that up as much as I can because I think it's good for everybody. But I'm not ashamed anymore to say, but, but this is the level. Because if you want to get to this next level, you got to spend a little bit of money and I'm going to give you a lot of value for it. And I'm going to help you measure that value. I'm going to show you that it's useful to you. But then if you want to climb to this next level, yeah, you're going to pay a little bit more money. So my point is I like what you're doing because if you can give some of it away for free and get into those really good conversations with folks, or maybe not even free, but low cost for some people, I think that's where we can start to figure out where those lines are. So what I did by accident was I didn't go with too much free to begin with. And that's helping me understand where some of those boundaries are. I think. Uh, I, sorry. I, don't know. I, I just ask me again in six months. Maybe I'll have a different story. I was just handed the most spiciest Bloody Mary I've ever tasted in my whole life. Wow. 
That's nice bloody Mary. <laughs> that was, yeah. Whew, I'm awake now. Whew, let's do this. Um, yeah, I think really what it boils down to is that give and take, right? How much you're going to give away to, for free is really the magic question that I hope we've helped you answer um, some of the pitfalls of giving too much away and some of the pitfalls of not giving enough away to make people excited about it. That's well, really where... Let me, let me do this because our listeners have been so great to us. Let us know. What, you tell us when you're evaluating it, where's the line? I know, Paul, you and I look at it differently now because we're running startups. We're, we're trying to figure it out ourselves where it is. And so everything we look at has got that eye. But if you're in an enterprise today and you're looking at security products, right? Mine's going to be more informational. Paul's is going to be more, um, would you say yours is more product focused, Paul? Yeah, yeah. All right, so so we got two different categories. So where where do you draw the line? And, and based on the stuff that we talked about, does it make sense? And what kind of transparency do you expect from us? I'm happy to share all of it. Do you care, or do you just want something that when you sign up it works? There's not a lot of hassle. Um, I tell you what, I hate the hard pitch, so you ne you're never going to get that from me. But I'm also not going to be afraid to say there's value in this. Let me show you how to do it. Here you go. So tell you what, if you're listening to this right now. And that's the kind of thing that you do engage with. I would love your feedback on how we can calibrate it better and how you, you assess it. That'd be interesting for both of us. And I think one aspect that ties into this too is pricing. And, and that's going to affect how successful your freemium program is. If you, you're giving something away for free, and the next jump from $0 to whatever it is, is too much for the customer yep. to handle, yep. then that's bad. So you have to structure your pricing starting at zero and make sure that the next step is fitting in with the value that your customers are seeing. And the only way you're going to understand that is by talking to your customers truthfully. Yeah, I, I agree with that. You know, if it's, if it's free, then all of a sudden it's a hundred thousand dollars a year yeah. to go to the next tier. Like yes. probably not going to work. Uh, yeah. It could, I mean, maybe, I mean, it's different for everyone, right? Depends on the value you're providing. Um, but yeah, but then having the, the next problem that we're looking at, right, is how do you structure the tiers, right? How do you do your pricing? So now you're starting at zero. Like, what are the next two or three tiers look like? Well, and, and where does I'm... it cap off at an enterprise for the product side, Michael, right? Where does it cap off at an enterprise sale? And your, um, your smaller customers, I mean, they're going to pay more. I mean, that's just what it is. And as they buy more, they're going to pay less per whatever thing you're charging at and that's just the way of the world and that model is the is you need to have that model before you offer the freemium product yeah i agree with that and it means that you have to understand who your ideal customer is and, and then you have to understand what their budgeting cycles look like and then either how you integrate into that or how you can help them bypass that mm -hmm. i'd say the big lesson i learned i i thought that the price that i set for my initial cohort was at a level where people wouldn't just reach into their own pockets and pay for it because it was going to benefit them. So it turns out that that didn't happen at all and, and that some of the people who didn't get in on it had nothing to do with the price. They would have paid five times the price, which, by the way, is, is good for me. Mm -hmm. But um, it was just all about cycling and timing. And so what I've learned now is I get a lot of conversations that say, well, when are you going to do that cohort again? And, and, and you know what? I'm not even sure I can do it this year. Are you going to do it again next year? And I'll get that into my cycle. Mm -hmm. Paul, that's all helped me with that freemium stuff as well because I have started to ask then, well, what's the level where you would pay by yourself and what do you need to prove in that that then you can make the case internally that you should spend your corporate training mm -hmm. dollars or right. your corporate money on this? And so you know, my situation is a little different than yours, but it's yet very much the same in terms of what do your tiers look like relative to what your customers mm -hmm. are, are used to paying or are able to pay? And how are you going to help guide them through that process? Yeah. And big eye opener for me. Got to have a plan that's going to continue, continually take people from free to paid. And it, yeah, what, what, what will end up happening is you'll just have a bunch of free customers that have no intention of moving. And that's not the situation you want to be in. You want to have, well, first, it's got to be easy. Right. And second, there has to be that value proposition and it has to make sense for them to move up uh, as they go along. Yeah. I mean, I, where, I, where I'm taking with it is there's that, you know, as we just read, I mean, Chris said, hey, look, 5% are going to take you up on that, that bigger stuff. 
but the key is make sure that 95% doesn't really need anything from you. Like it's, it's a much yes, better it's price a low point. Cost, right. And so that, that's always in my head too, because look, frankly, if as an industry, we start using your tool more and more, or people start using the stuff that I put together more and more, and it doesn't really take a lot for me, but I can do regular content on it. It gives me ideas. It helps me solve problems. And, and as an industry, we get better. That's great. I don't need everybody. In fact, I, I've, got some stuff I'm going to add into the next cohort, I have to limit it because of, because of the way that I scale. That's good uh, for me. That's great for the people who get to participate. So I also want to make sure that even if you're on that freemium side, you've got value. It's good for you that you're going to stay connected because we also don't know when they're going to level up. So no, you're right. I mean, I, I, think, I think it's an interesting model. I think it's interesting in security. I think it's interesting in the enterprise how, how that works and how you can convert that up to... Um, but uh, no, those are things we're going to keep taking a look at. I'd love to hear what people say. I think the next story is um, very relevant to our current discussion about the uh, seven common mistakes entrepreneurs make uh, in their marketing planning. Yeah, here's what spoke to me about it. Because, you know, look, listicles, right? this is called a listicle. Everybody loves mm -hmm. listicles. They're good for clickbait. So I always look at these, and then I try to figure out if they're useful or not. Um, but you and I are both working through this ourselves. And here's the thing that I've seen. Um, and I, you know what? I'm going to go through all seven of these really fast, and then let's talk about it. Okay. S mistake number one, not having a plan. Well, I can't tell you how many startups I come across that yeah. have absolutely no freaking plan. I, I don't get it. All right, number two, they're not specific enough. E equally unbelievable. Not marketing today for tomorrow. Um, I've been guilty of this myself. Mm -hmm. So, I, but it's a common mistake. Creating an inflexible marketing plan, and I'll be honest there, that's a big challenge. Never looking at the plan is mistake number five. Number six, putting all your eggs in one basket. I've been burned doing that more than once. And mistake number seven, not knowing your audience. I would probably push that up higher in mm -hmm. terms of priority. But, but man, when I looked at that, <coughs> I went, yep. Yep. Like either I've done it or I've seen it or I've tried to figure it out in the last last couple of years. Anything there you disagree with, Paul? No. And, you know, I in my role at Security Weekly, I, I help people with marketing. And, you know, these are certainly some good one on one things for startups uh, to learn. This is a good this is marketing one on one for your startup. Right. At a very it's a very high level, which I thought was good. And you have to be thinking about all these things. The execution in each of these things they're recommending is is a much bigger story and much harder to uh to overcome what i what i thought was interesting one of the things that i heard is um you know a couple of things one all your eggs in one basket like hey we're going to advertise on myspace yeah right how'd that how that work out for okay you? tom <laughs> yeah exactly um also not being <clears throat> specific enough is interesting because i hear a lot of people and i'm like so how are you going to market that and they're like we're going to do a social media campaign <laughs> like Okay, so wow. who are you targeting? How are you targeting them? And what's your messaging that you're going to put behind it? And how are you going to tie that back to a campaign for your products or services? And they're like, huh? No, we're just going to do social media. I'm like, right. no, 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 there's a lot that goes, that goes in on that. Uh, I mean, first, uh, and I, I like your suggestion to move up um, number seven because they may say, well, okay, they'll come back and say, well, we're going to do this campaign on Facebook and this campaign on Twitter and this campaign here. And I'm like, so is that, is that where your audience is? Like, yep. how do, you, do you know your audience? And that's, is that what they're, and they're like, well, well, no, we're just, you know, Facebook is the largest one. So we're going to hit Facebook. I'm like, but if your target audience or target customer isn't on Facebook, you're just wasting your marketing dollars. I, I completely agree with you. And, and again, we see it all the time. The other thing I'll see too is they'll say, well, I mean, you know, I've got enterprise experience and so uh, I'm going to go help the SMBs. Okay. Well, where are they looking for people like you? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. Okay, well, what kind of money do they have to spend on it? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, how are they making the decisions? I don't know. Guys, these are some basic things you got to figure out. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me tell you one of the lessons I learned, too. Um, I'll go to mistake number four, creating an inflexible marketing plan. I, I think there's a fine line here between having a system or a process that eases your production. Right? And, what, and I don't know about you. I now separate out production from programming. So the programming is the content that I want to be able to provide and the mm -hmm. themes and that type of stuff. And then the production is the actual build it, make it, publish it. 
Well, so what I find is kind of interesting is that I have some grandiose ideas, and a couple times I've really tried to execute on all of them at once. Uh, it hasn't worked yet. But, but what I'm starting to understand is that by prioritizing the ones that give the best benefit to my ideal customers, then as they get going and I can process those out better, then I can start to layer on other stuff. And as I've gotten more mature with it, Paul, I've got things I can't wait to roll out, but I can tell you right now, it's not going to happen to next year. There's certain things that, that have to be in place first. There's right. either a certain time I have to have or I have to be able to hire the help for it or, or whatever it so, is. So I have some it's, advice for you along those lines. I'd um, like to hear it. Consider your campaign, right? Build a campaign. And your campaign is, has a timeline. So that means you're not mm. doing everything all at once. One of the greatest benefits of doing that, Michael, is you can create your content and then have a plan and a campaign for it that hits a specific market or is part of a certain messaging that you're trying to put forward and your content ties to that. And then you start building your campaign and reusing that same content. So for example, mm -hmm. you may, I don't know, you'd create a, uh, a video or a webcast on uh, Straight Talk, right? And then like your first thing is, okay, well, we're going to deliver the webcast and then we're going to market the webcast in, in this way. And then once the webcast is done, I'm going to create a survey. So like you don't need the survey day one, like you've got some time and then you're right. going to follow up with a survey. And then from there, you know, we're going to do maybe um, a blog post series and maybe we'll embed the video in a couple of those, those blog posts and then the, the video will go to YouTube and we'll do some marketing there. And then, um, you know, you may say, I want to make an appearance on someone else's podcast or whatever, just as an example, right? And you're going to reference that content and talk about it to a different audience and then maybe round it out with a presentation at a conference where your target audience is. So you have this campaign. It's over a point in time. It gives you, you don't have to have all the content to start with. You just need one piece of content but to start with. But you've thought it out. Yeah. And then you're you're building upon it and you're thinking it out. And that's you know, that's how I, when I worked in marketing, right? I mean, we did a campaign based marketing like that and we how, reused so a lot of our content. So how long was the campaign? I mean, I, I realize it's variable, but give me like, like a 90 day cycle or a couple Yeah, of weeks. I mean, it depends on a lot of things, but you know, a couple of months is good, you know? Well, I, I'd say, I, I'd say it's more important that you cap it if it's too long, right? Or, or okay. if it's yeah. six months to a year, Make sure you've got enough time to create all that content to keep at a, it's more important to keep at a regular pace than it is like a, whether it's a short campaign or a long campaign. So you well, may have a short campaign, just don't overload that with too much content or, or don't have enough, right? Well, like if you're just doing a webcast, that's not a campaign, right? right. Like you that's, need a couple of things in, in a series. If you're doing a, in a, a lot of larger companies, we're going to do a year long campaign, right? And that involves multiple people creating content across a theme for an entire year. And that feels like the kind of thing you can build up to. So basically, yes. you know, it's fascinating is I, I have on one of my tasks to get done uh, between today and Monday is thinking strategically about my marketing. I, it's, it's, yes. I'm at that point. So we talk about debt, right? We, and we're probably going to keep talking about it. I've realized now that the stuff that's on my website made sense, you know, three weeks ago, maybe say mm -hmm. 12 weeks ago. Now I've learned so much, it's time to update it. And I, right. there's a different approach to it. And, but what's interesting is I've got on the list, okay, let me go look out for the next 90 days. What do I want to write about? What webcast do I have? I've actually got three or four events, uh, including one up in your neck of the woods, and I'm mm -hmm. going to try to stay long enough to come up and be nice. in studio with you. Nice. So as we look at some of my stuff, it's, so your timing is perfect, brother, because you're helping me think through some of the things I'm trying to work through yeah. right now. Yeah, I mean, and I put the marketing plan together for our, our startup offensive countermeasures and it, it was really, okay, f let's go from now to the end of the year. What do we want to do? Who do we want to hit? How many leads do we want to generate? Where do we want to market to? And so we're like, you know, do, you do webcast here, presentation here, blog post series here. This blog post goes on these blogs. We advertise that mm -hmm. in these social networks. And, and, you know, that's our small marketing plan you know, for the rest of the year. So you can do short, short runs of it. Well, so, and my thought was too, is this helps me, right? I, I've become a big fan of just getting out and talking to people uh, and, and creating dialogue because there's, I'm finding there's no better way to learn. So I'm looking at, if I just get between now and the end of the year, then I can use that little holiday break yes. and, and basically plan again, at least for the next 90 days. But <laughs> at some point I, I can see where what I'm doing stabilizes enough and I have enough behind me 
mm-hmm. that I can maybe do a six month campaign now, and then I can I, probably I build hate, up for a year. I hate the term thought leadership. Right. Yes. But, I, well, that to me that always means like you've got like like a mama duck with a bunch of little ducks yeah. behind him. If you're a thought leader, I right. expect to see thoughts lined up behind you, just following you. <laughs> it just goes to the gutter. But one of the things, and you should, everyone should do this, right? Is identify your goals for your marketing plan, right? Mm-hmm. Or those leads, or those whatever they are. And a lot, oftentimes, the goal is we want to establish ourselves i won't use thought leader we'll establish <laughs> ourselves as experts in this particular topic right? right so if you do that first and you set that goal then you can say okay what activities should we do to establish ourselves as an expert in this whatever it is like who's the audience for that yep. where do they hang out what content do they like and then you apply that content and, and put a campaign together and it's one of the things john has identified for me, um, even though he says he's not really into marketing, uh, he's got great ideas in marketing. He's like, we need to make sure that we're experts like in this, in this topic with this audience, right? And I'm like, well, that's really important. Now I can build the marketing plan and a campaign around that. And that's essentially, you know, what we've done. And also make sure the, the problem that we have is expanding our market, right? Like obviously we do the podcast and we speak at conferences, but how do we expand our audience in our, our marketing campaigns? And it's something for the podcast that we've done as well, because believe it or not, we do marketing for our podcast, right? So, you know, how do we constantly branch out to new, to new people? That should also be probably one of your goals in every marketing campaign, right? Reach a, a broader audience. Okay. That's, uh, that's some good advice. Hey, and this can go personally as well. This is, I mean, this is like career planning or yeah. if maybe your career planning and in your career path, you listen to the show and you're like, I want to have a startup. Start now, right? Like start planning your career in thinking about, well, where, where do you want to be an expert? And what circles do you want to be in where people recognize your content? And that can start to lead up to, when you you launch your start even if your startup is i want to launch this open source project or this you know research project or whatever a lot of us in security do that they're listening to the show go through the same the same thought process as well yeah and and all i'll add to that is is think about what problems you're solving today right because when i when i look at people in terms of their career and stuff if i say what do you do and the answer is i do security 20 years ago i totally knew what that meant well probably not but i pretend i did now Mm -hmm. i don't know what that means but think about the things that you do, and then you either have a choice. I like what I do, and I want to get better at it. I want to be known for this. Or this isn't what I want to be doing. I like the field. Yep. I like security. I like whatever. But I really want to go do X. And you can pivot to that. You can. It might take some time, but I like that point, Paul. It's the same type of a process, right? So it's understanding <laughs> the environment. It's understanding mm-hmm. the context. It's understanding what people want and looking for a way to put it together. Which, of course, then leads us into the way that you would uh, be able to pitch yourself. Absolutely. You know, we can't seem to get away from this. Um, the pitch, and, and you know what? I'm, I'm realizing that the pitch might be like one of those topics that no matter how often I look at it, I still feel like I'm only seeing the tip of the iceberg. Like there's this yep. freaking I, huge I piece of what, ice under the water. Like well, the more so, I dig in, the more I realize there's so many aspects to it. And you correctly pointed out that it, at some point or in the middle of the article, they said, here are the 11 things to cover. And I was like, well, I got to go back and redo my pitch. <laughs> and I think that's just, yeah. you know, that's always what you do is you go back and redo your pitch over and over again. And I'm I'll like, I you. like this. I want to, int- now I'm not going to do all 11 things in order as they're listed there, but and I'm going to-, to integrate those aspects into my pitch for sure. Yeah. So here, here's the thing. I, I've, I, so obviously I've spent what, 12 years of my career looking specifically at how we communicate. So I, so I've got a lot invested in this. But here's the thing. I'm always happy to learn more, and I've become a big believer in um, universals. So when I look at stuff like this now, what I want to do, and the reason I, anything I, I put up for us, it'll be because I saw value in it. Because it either it reinforced something that I believe in but did it simpler, or it gave us something else to think about. But I'm going to give you one more thing that I thought about myself this weekend. So I sat down because I'm about to start offering some services around straight talk. And I've got, and I've been really wrestling. I had a breakthrough late last night on how I want to better uh, position it. But I said, you know what? We're doing all this stuff on pitching. Uh, I've done this stuff for years. I know how to make presentations. But let me, let me go back. Let me take a fresh look at this. And I, I found about maybe 10 or so of the articles that we've liked. 
I printed them out, sat down in front of the football game, started highlighting things. And then, uh, and then I coalesced it, and I had this kind of a breakthrough. And if this is useful, this is one of those things, uh, I'll give people like the basics of it for free if it's useful. And what, I, what I'm doing is I'm not creating a pitch deck. I'm creating what I'm calling a dialogue deck. And it has a series of questions. Now, does it have key points? Yes. And does it have things that um, we can talk about? Yeah, but here's, here's the distinction. And I've, I've been given this probably too much thought. Mm-hmm. When you pitch, now by the way, it, we, you've got to pitch an investor, right? If there's pitch nights, you got to be able to pitch. If you're on Shark Tank, we haven't brought up Shark Tank yet tonight. Oh, I'm Shark glad. Tank, See, we almost went through the whole episode without mentioning Shark Tank. So, so we're good. <laughs> Look, there are times that you have to pitch, and your pitch needs to be tight. It needs to be practiced. You need to invest in it. It's great. But what I started looking at was that other side. What happens when you want to go into the industry and you work with people that you think could benefit from what you do, but you're not exactly sure – if it's not quite selling yet, you, you want somebody to buy it, but you're not ready to sit. So it's not a sales pitch. It's not a product pitch. It's a, so what I'm calling is a dialogue deck, and I, I broke it down, uh, and I broke one of my own rules, right? You, if you know, I, I like threes and fives. So I got like nine prompts that you've got to be able to answer, uh, or nine questions, nine, nine dialogues that you need to have. And the reason I did dialogue is debates and discussions are about proving your point and proving your right. A dialogue is about understanding. And what I've realized is, because we've talked about this a lot in the program too, you've got to go talk to your customers. You've got to go understand the marketplace. And what I thought was, you know what? I can say to people, here's the problem I can solve. Here's how I look at it, but what do you think? And I'll give you a quick example. I do leadership summits. So one of the things I said is, hey, I can offer you a leadership summit for your company. And everybody went, oh, that's nice. I don't care. Now, the way I described it was, I could come on site. We'll do like a working session. And, and we'll use straight talk underlying it, and we'll get a chance to talk about leadership communication, but we'll really apply it to whatever you want to solve. Nobody cared. Got talking to people. You know what they said, Paul? Hey, you know what would be great? Could you do like a working session where you came in and you helped us solve a problem? And I swear to you, that's exactly what I just described. But I didn't use their words. I didn't use their setup. I didn't figure it out. And that's kind of why I'm looking at this now to say, so I like this idea of pitching, um, but if you like the idea of, of the dialogue deck, or it's, Paul, even if it's something that you're personally interested in, uh, I'll share with you the stuff I'm working on. It's, it's kind of in the mind map early stages, and I'm going to spend some time in the next week or so working through some of the concepts. Uh, it's either uh, brilliant or foolish, and mm-hmm. in two weeks I'll have a much better sense of which it is. But, there you go. Well, I just uh, pitching, the, the thing about this is if you're pitching people all the time, it means that you think you've got all the answers. Mm-hmm. And you might not be open to not just feedback, but the discussion, the dialogue that can right, come right, from it. Right, right. And all I'm saying is just put some 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 focus on that as you, as you take a look at it. But you're yeah, right. like these eleven things are things. You're I absolutely right, saying, Michael. The yeah. you have to be able to discuss it. And what I've seen, Shark Tank as an example, right? What I've seen is you where people fall down is they'll have all these eleven things, but then they get a question. And they'll completely fall down and they won't be able to, to back up. Or sometimes, I think we talked about this before, right? It goes both ways. They're like, well, have you ever, con- the investors will ask, have you ever considered selling it this way? And they're like, oh, well, I- I'd be open to all of your ideas. That's fantastic. And they're right. like, yep, nope, failed, next. Um, yeah. what, what you need to say is, yeah, like when we talk about market trends, for example, or even better, when we talk about monetization model, like, here's how I think we're going to, here's how I believe that we're going to make money with this startup idea. And when you get questions about that, you got to be able to have a dialogue, but you also have to be able to back up your point. Like, here's why we, we have this monetization. Yeah. And that's the one you'll get the question on, I think, probably almost every time you pitch, right, is... How are you going to make money doing this? What's your plan? Well, yeah, look, money? I mean, it, it's, in the, it's in the five points, right? When we talk about the, from going from idea to execution, right? And, and it's, you got to have a plan. You got to show me how you're going to get 10 times revenue in yeah. a five year period. And the, the thing I keep saying is, look, if you want to call it a model or whatever, I, I, none of it matters to me. You pick your favorite book, your favorite whatever. Yeah. But what you've got to do is convince me as an investor or me as a buyer or whatever that it's going to work. And so it's got to make sense. And so you're right. If I come back and say, well, why don't you do X? And you're like, no, I'll totally do X. Oh, no, 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 no. No. There is a way to say, well, we, I'll tell you what. We looked at X. We didn't know how to solve this part of the problem. And so we, we went to this because it made more sense to us. Yep. Now, at that point, the investor might say, right, yeah, but I can help you with, with the other one. You go, well, I'd be interested in talking about that with you yes. then. 
right? And, and I think that's a different thing. So, yeah, so w- here's what this has. If you're in that point where you need to pitch, what it's basically saying is, and this is, so the way I like it is, it's a distinction between questions and prompts. So this is saying you have to convey why you're qualified and why they should give you money. And that means there's 11 things they're going to want to know about. You need to be cognizant of answering it. But my favorite one in this, 100%, is habit number six. It's the 24-hour follow-up. One of the things that used to happen, and I still do this when we teach communication, I break down the structure of it. Delivery on the chart is only 20%. It's one-fifth of the five steps to communicate what counts. But, Paul, it's maybe 5% of the total thing, right? So much of it is the prep, everything else. And then of that delivery... It's not just standing up and delivering your pitch. It's that follow-up. And it's not just, I mean, this says the thank them and, and, and update them and everything else. Here's what I'm going to tell you is most important. Somebody in your pitch is going to make a comment. At least I hope for you that they make a comment. Maybe it's a compliment. Maybe it's a question. And this is what I see a lot. They ask a question. And you go, oh, I'll totally get you that answer. And then you don't. Mm-hmm. If they ask you a question, they're expecting you to give them an answer. Mm-hmm. Give them an answer. Follow yep. up with them. And the number of times, I get this all the time when, when people brief me. I don't hear from them. And I'll ask a question. I'll knock them off pace. And I'll tell them what's up. And they'll, oh, I'll, I'll get you that answer right away. And so what I started saying is, when, when can I expect that answer? Mm-hmm. And they're like, um, I'll have it to you tomorrow. I said, well, sounds great. And then it just never shows up. Yeah. Ever. That's bad. Uh, running short on time. Uh, last couple stories, Michael. Well, let's. We don't have to go through a ton of them. We can we can hit them pretty quick. Um, there were two, and so there's one here that I, I just thought that was really interesting. We can sum it up fast. It was on TechCrunch a little while ago, and it said the startup economy is replacing the traditional resume. Now, here's why I think it's interesting when we're talking about security startups. We keep saying we have a challenge in security that we don't have enough people, and I've been vocal on mm-hmm. all of the programs that I don't agree with that. But what I will say is, we do struggle to define what it is that we mean. We're not sure how to define our roles properly, and that's from the CISO all the way down. And therefore, we don't know what we're looking for. We don't know how to interview for it. We don't know how to give people that type of a guidance. Well, it turns out the whole world's kind of in the same boat doing the exact same thing. And what they're starting to see now happening in Silicon Valley, not just the TV show, uh, but um, what we're looking at, I'll just cut it down to this. Startups are filling that void. it's, It's your proof. It's how... I can look at what you've done, I, and, and if I'm trying to hire you, I'm not asking how much money did you make, what was your, what was your minimum viable product. What I'm going to look at is what did you do, how did that operate, how did those things go, how did all those pieces come together. And as, as that all makes sense and I understand that, it makes it easier to hire you or to hire a team. So here's what I think it means too to another extent. We just talked about using some of this stuff for your personal gain and how to get better at stuff. Yeah, if you've got an idea for a startup, look, Mark wants to do masterminds. You've got opportunities there. If you've got these other things that you want to do, go ahead and, and do a startup or participate in one of these incubator or accelerator mm-hmm. programs because you might find that's how you prove your value in the security market space. I just thought it was an interesting thing to consider in that if you're in a startup, the answer isn't always... I've got to get funded, I've got to get an IPO, I've got to make millions of dollars. It might just be, I'm going to get some really awesome experience and prove what my value is to somebody else. Right. Well, and speaking of getting money, the last story talks about how VCs are holding on to their cash for cyber security. Yeah, so I just want to point out a couple quick things with it. So it, it basically says, look, this, it's, a, it's a good article, uh, and, it, and it, it, it just came out today, so it's a pretty current article. And it says, all right, 2014, $2.6 billion put in the security startups. 2015, $3.8 billion put in. Oh, but this year we're only looking at, at uh, $3, million, or $3 billion. Um, so, oh, that means it's all cooling off. I want to just say, first of all, I'm not convinced that that's true. We might see a lot of fourth quarter activity that we didn't yes. forecast properly. So I'm not sure about that. But the other part that they basically said, and it's got some other facts and figures in here that I really liked. The key point to it was, well, what we're seeing is there's a lot of M&A activity uh, coming here, but we see that VCs are becoming more discerning with their cybersecurity investments. This might be something, Paul, that that we carry over and we talk about again, because here's the thing I want people to think about when you read a story like this. Okay, so what's the role that the buyer plays? If you're you're a startup and you've got an enterprise solution, Paul, like you've got, What's the role of that buyer in helping you get that traction and or connect you to the VCs? To the VCs, 
what buyers are you talking to? Are you going to the same conferences? Are we talking to CISOs and CIOs and, and, and other people to understand their challenges better and how that's working out? And so I, I think this requires looking at it a little bit more because what this article is saying is, well, there might be less money and they're more discerning. So if you're not really well established, I'm not sure. I think that's true, but I'm also looking at a lot of smaller venture funds and angel funds that are going security. How do we get in on that? Let's be part of that. Well, so, also too, in in using my own startup as an example, not every startup now is taking money in security. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, I mean, there just might be a few less companies taking money because they're they're trying to maybe they're a lot of things could be happening, right? <clears throat> a lot of small security companies that I talk to, they're like, yeah. No, like we built up a good audience. Like we're going to sell to these people and, right. you know, people are buying it. And right now I don't, I don't need to take money. Right. Like that's cool. Or they may be seeing that it's more difficult to get money. It, whether that's true or not, they're seeing that and taking that as, well, I'm going to do a couple more things. Kind of like what we're doing, like eh, a couple yeah, more things before we even go ask for money. Yeah, right? and that's not necessarily a bad thing. No. But, but what it's also doing too is it's only looking largely at large VC, big institutional investment. Mm-hmm. Um, we're, we're, I mean, $3 billion and there's like 300 deals. That's still a lot. It's not accounting for the angel investment. It's not accounting mm-hmm. for the things that are happening in IoT. There's a lot of pieces that this misses, and I'm not knocking it. I actually think this is good. It's good mm-hmm. piece. It's got a lot of good insights into it. But where I think, and, and we'll carry this over, or at least these themes over, the thing I keep coming back to that I don't see anybody else really doing, and I want our show to do consistently, is build the triangle. And so you got the startups, you got the buyers, you got the investors. We need to keep looking at that angle. So if that's the case, that means that the buyers play a big role in that early traction and defining your value. That means if you're a startup, you need to be working with those people diligently. By the way, if you're one of those people, go find the startups, work with them. You're going to make a big difference in this industry, and that's going to help the investors as they do better. So anyway, that's the way that I I thought. That's why I thought it was interesting for us. Awesome. Well, thank you as always, Michael. It's always fun doing this show. Look forward to doing a lot more. This was episode 10. We'll see everyone on the next episode of Startup Security Weekly.